there, fellow hoplites. I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. And on today's show, we're going to show you how to grease the palms of the gods as we skim through the mythic odysseys of Theros. So it's time to get Iliad on WebDM. If you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. WebDM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web, Web Demons. Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. All right, Jim, let us set out on our mythic odyssey here in the land of Theros. First off, well, well, you know, this book hasn't come out yet. It's out on D&D Beyond, D &D I guess. Beyond. The, the electronic version is available, but the physical book's not out yet. Although, given what I've read of it so far, I'd probably be picking it up just because I like to have books as opposed yeah, to, Yeah, so you know, let's, how about let's... things, like a hard copy. So we're not going to do a deep dive just yet because we haven't, haven't had it that long to look at. No. But let's just go through the highlights. Right. Uh, uh, first impressions that kind of thing, what people can expect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is Theros exactly? Theros is a Magic the Gathering setting that's inspired by uh, Greek mythology and sort of uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey and uh, Hesiod and, and some of the other, uh, you know, myth makers of ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. This is not a game or, or a supplement to recreate those myths. This is not uh, ancient Greek uh, role playing. That's There's other games for that. This is like playing in the world of Theros, which has its own spin on it, they, they sort of take the themes of greatness, of like the gods playing a, a very intimate role in society and, and their champions being the heroes of myth uh, and, and legend. And sort of like Ravnica, it's Magic the Gathering conformed to Dungeons and Dragons expectations. So you're not going to find anything about the mana, the different colors of mana. There's no new magic system, etc. There's not even any new spells. But what you do get is a stealth deities and demigods like book which yeah. massively expands the role of gods gives you a ton of tools for like incorporating them into your games and then like a, a lot of really cool adventure tools uh to implement that that are theros specific um and of course there's uh mythic monsters uh which is i think maybe what a lot of people are are, uh, are salivating over it's similar to ravnica in that it's a setting book with character and dm options that if you file the serial numbers off are useful in any number of campaign settings. But I think this is really well done. I'm really impressed with the book, even though like it's not uniform. There's parts of it that I'm less impressed with. But with two Magic the Gathering books, you know, now out, I'm like, this is some of my favorite stuff for fifth edition. There's any number of Magic the Gathering settings I would I would like to see. Zendikar, Dominaria, uh, Takir, I think is the one with the, uh, the dragons. But I do think that uh, this book, uh, the material within it would be more easily uh, infused into your just run-of-the-mill D&D game, regardless yeah. than, say, Ravnica would. Regardless, yeah. It, yeah, it conforms to that more high fantasy feel where Ravnica is definitely like Magitech. Uh -huh. uh, um, you know, steampunkish yeah, yeah. or adjacent, you know. There's stuff in Theros the, the, that I think should have been in the DMG. There's advice on how to like talk about gods and how they move about the world and how they send their omens to mortals. That's mm -hmm. like, yeah, this is kind of, this should have been in the main core rule books. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> to chapter one, which is the character options. Uh, starts out, and it's a yes. pretty robust as far as, as what they give you, uh, different uh, different takes on some character uh, races that you could play before, uh, but it's slightly mm -hmm, mm -hmm. changed. Like, they hit the ground running with heroes, and what their definition of heroes is and, and how they fit into this setting. And so one of the things that I, I really appreciated is the first thing you read about is how to change your ideals, bonds, and flaws to match the heroic uh, scale mm -hmm of this place. You're not you're not playing just sort of nobodies who who make their way up in the world and eventually become, you know, somebodies. You're kind of playing people that are either from birth or, or at least at character creation already sort of chosen and picked out by the gods. They they've had their their fate, you know, manipulated or or chosen for them in some way uh, so that they stand out and they're blessed in that sense. Yeah. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff in in this first part of chapter 1 that's like, all right, what omens accompanied your birth? 
you know, what what ideal do you have that goes beyond just the the normal ones that you'd find in the player's handbook? And how does it connect to the gods, particularly the god that you might be, you know, that might serve as your patron? Uh, and similarly with like bonds and, and flaws, they have advice on how to turn them from the the mundane, you know, character traits that they have in the PHB and make them epic, basically, for lack of a better word. You know, it's like a flaw isn't just, oh, I've got a drinking problem or whatever. I'm on the sauce again. It's something much, <laughs> right, it's something much grander than that. If you were to give in to this flaw or, or somehow act upon it, you're going to piss off a god. Mm -hmm. You know, you clash with the gods of Theros. And that's really something that, that should be kept in mind as you're reading through this. This is all about the interaction between mortals and gods. And they start us off right at the beginning, like, boom, how, you know, here is your place. You might be a mortal, but you're not just any mortal. Mm -hmm. And while one god might favor you, you're going to have to deal with the other 14 of them yeah. in, in, in the course of your, uh, your adventures. Mm -hmm. But uh, also the, um, uh, what are they called, the, the not divine gifts? Supernatural, Supernatural gifts. gifts. Yeah. Like the fact that it's just like, yeah, you gotta pick from one of these things and, and you know, it has options in there. If you wanna do feats, you basically get a feat at first level if you want that. The, the, just the good old feat at first level, just because <laughs> uh, the god Nyx favored you on the night of your birth or, or whatever. But there's a couple of those, right, uh, right. <laughs> a couple of those gifts though that are pretty nuts. The uh, anvil rot immediately stuck out at me. Yeah. If you, so you wanna be whatever race, but you also kinda wanna be a warforged. <laughs> Yeah, and, and it's like a stealth way to play the the race options that are not included in it. So like, there's only six mm -hmm. uh, by by the rules of Theros. You know, you can't play a a dragonborn right. unless you're an anvil rot who just happens to look like a dragonborn. Right. If you're familiar with the uh, the myth of Talos uh, as crafted by Hephaestus, that's sort of the character that I'm thinking of there. Yeah. Like, this is you're a unique creation of the gods, who who they're the only ones that can make these things in the first place you know and so one of them has has crafted you and then sent you down i really the anvil rot's really uh really fun in that regard heroic destiny i can see being very popular mm -hmm. <laughs> given the kind of abilities it gives you, you uh, just advantage not... on death saves is yeah big. <laughs> yeah do you just not want to die because also you get the what the ability if you dropped a zero you dropped a one instead like once a day yeah you get that like half or the half orc endurance and and like there's a lot of options here, where if you look at them sideways, these are uh, features from other character options that are put here. Mm -hmm. So like an example of that would be like, the Unscarred has Goliath's ability to like negate uh, D12 plus con mod damage. And while I wish it was more <laughs> frequent than once a short or long rest, uh, it's still pretty cool that there is another way to get those types of abilities. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is on top of your background, on top of your, uh, you know, the class race options that you have. So and I think Nyxborn is probably my favorite yeah. because you're a magical construct. <laughs> like you could be a dream that's come to life or an idea that's made made manifest in the world. And mm -hmm. like to me, that's the that's the kind of weird off the wall, like kind of character options that I that at this point I really like to see. You, you got to get really weird for me to, to get very excited mm -hmm. about things these days. Yeah, so, probably. You know, that's just me. Yeah. One of my favorites <laughs> is the the Oracle, uh, just because it, and it kind of feeds into a, a mechanic that we're going to talk about. That's from the next chapter, which is piety. But, yeah. you know, you basically get like a set of spells based on how pious, how, how well you play up this Oracle fact. So you can eventually get augury divination right. and commune but you could be a fighter that that reads the fucking blood splatter of his enemies and that's how he that's how they're an oracle and i, yeah. I don't know i just yeah. i love that yeah. aspect anything that gives you uh, access to magical abilities and powers outside of being a sp explicit mm. spellcaster yeah in that sense i like this better than ravnica because ravnica has they give you a bonus to say you know the spells that you can cast but you still need spell casting yeah. or you know there's spell casting feature to make use of them whereas this is like between supernatural gifts the benefits of piety the other things that you can use it's like you could easily be a you know a non-casting class that has access to multiple spells that are very specific uh, to what you would want to do, the mm -hmm. kind of spells that you would like to have. That's sort of a common theme throughout this that I, that I really like and highlights how mm -hmm. magical this place really uh, most is. Most definitely. Uh, and to kind of round out the chapter, yeah. uh, some of the races that you have access to, of course, are like uh, Centaur, Minotaur. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what's, what's one of the highlights for you, Jim? 
So I think like of the six of them, uh, Human Centaur, Leonin, Minotaur, Satyr, and Triton. Quick out of the way, they add Dark Vision to Tritons, which they should have always had, uh, but it's sort of retcon for Bolos. I like Tritons, even though they're not the most mechanically uh, optimized, I guess. The real standouts, though, for me are uh, the Leonin and the Satyr, the new ones. Mm -hmm. um, Centaur is pretty much... Uh, as far as I can tell, looks like the one in Ravnica, except uh, Theros is a fey, not a humanoid. And then Minotaur is the same, which is kind of like, they got two really cool abilities, but they both use your bonus action, so you can't use them together. Yeah. Kind of sucks. Um, but, you know, you're still a big Minotaur, so maybe that makes up for it. But the Leonin are this really, they're like a... A strong tabaxi. Yeah, yeah. That's, right. that's what they are. They have <laughs> another cat. They person. got a little extra movement. They got the claws. They don't have the climbing uh -huh. and the speed. Yep. They got that roar to no. like in, to scare that yeah. shit out of people. A bonus action as and a, well. Yeah, and it, which is what I really yeah. like. With poor Dragonborn, right? Like just having to use their whole action to breathe fire or acid or whatever. <laughs> whatever. So I don't know. I, I house rule that uh, myself. But yeah, Leonin have a really cool ability. Their con strength, 35 speed, like you said. Um, they just seem like a fun type to play. Like I, I like the idea of a, a lion person mm -hmm. is very appealing to me. Um, and so, of course, one of the major uh, planeswalkers from Magic the Gathering is a Leonin. So that might inform some of it for me. Yeah. Um, Seder, though. Yeah. I, I'm not sure I'd let one of them... Uh, let a player play one. <laughs> you don't. You don't. Personally. You don't want a horny goat man in your game. Uh, not with magic resistance. <laughs> who's a fae? Yeah, that's a con dex uh, bonus. Like this, it's just one of those where it's like this looks a little too good, and there's a, too many combos of classes and, and multi class features that would you know really like to have a plus charisma plus dex thirty five foot move speed, not humanoid with magic resistance I, I, uh, option for themselves. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I can off the top of my head think of at least six character concepts. Just like right. Also, you get plus D eight jump. Um, oh yeah, it's a strong option, and and I'm really kind of surprised that magic resistance made it through. Yonti also have magic resistance, and it's sort of one of those. It's, it's one of those where it's like. Is advantage on all spell saves really like that's a monster ability mm -hmm. to me and like there's other ways they could have gone about you know it could have been like okay well they also have proficiency in this other kind of save you know regardless of what their class gives them it's not breaking the bank but it does like smell like cheese it smells like bad cheese yeah. to me there's also some subclasses in there. There's a couple. Yeah, there's a couple. Uh, I, I really like the College of Eloquence. I think it's fun. Uh, I talked about this on, on Todd Talks. We spent a whole hour uh, about it, so <laughs> I'm not going to go that deep into it. I would just say this. If you're going to use College of Eloquence, uh, DMs out there, if you've got one of these characters in your uh, in your party, you really should familiarize yourself with the difficulty class thresholds to influence people found in the DMG because this class is going to, bend those over the knee and just break them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a kind of character who can talk their way out of just about anything uh, if you let them. So it's one of those where you've got to have some ideas of what your NPCs are willing to do, what they want to do, uh, et cetera, because otherwise the College of Eloquence is probably never going to fail a persuasion role, um, as is appropriate uh, for them. And then Oath of Glory is a mixed bag for me. Paladin Oath, obviously. It's the old uh, Oath of Heroism that was in Unearthed Arcana, minus all of the crit fishing craziness that was in that uh, particular UA. And it's like, they've got a weird aura that doesn't have the same radius as other Paladin auras. And it's a class that, that wants to be at the front of the line leading the charge, but it's actually better if they go last at initiative. Just the way the mechanic language uh, interacts with the fiction is kind of weird. Um, but it's not like terrible. Mm -hmm. It's not like the worst paladin ever. You could have a lot of fun with it. It would not be um, team focused very much. Like this is someone who wants to stand out to be noticed for their own contribution and not so much like making their allies better, but that's kind of what the paladin does. So I leave it up to individual players and dungeon masters to like reconcile that lore with uh, what the class does. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing it gives you is athlete, which is a new background, uh, acrobatics and athletics, obviously. And then a really cool thing of where you get to roll to see if an NPC has heard of you before. Do they know who you are? Uh, were, you know, were they present at the games where you made a name for yourself? I, I like that because it like embeds your character in the world. You got that star power. Hell yeah. They got, that, they got the reputation, you know? Most definitely. And speaking of reputation, uh, at least that with the gods. Moving on to chapter two. This goes into like all the gods and how they uh, interact with the world and but also it introduces the piety mechanic which is probably the the the, the biggest standout to me at least 
in the book as far as how to implement it and it's it's rewards a lot of the chatter out there you know the first impressions for theros has been focused more on the mythic monsters and that's nice that's great. Uh, but to me, it's the piety uh, mechanic here, what they're introducing that has the most uh, impactful implications for Dungeons and Dragons going forward. If you don't use anything else from the book, chapter two is worth, is almost, is, to me, it's almost worth the price of the whole book itself, given the level of detail they go into it, given the fact that they give you 15 examples of deities that have not just like, what does this god do, but like, how do you earn its favor? How do you lose its favor? What kind of backgrounds, classes, etc., does this god uh, tend to support? What does it mean when you've earned piety uh, for them? What benefits do you get? Uh, what kind of schemes does that god get up to? What do they want to do? How do they relate to the other gods? It's like it goes into such detail. And because there's 15 examples, the ch chances are that you can like file the serial numbers off of, say, Heliod, and just make that uh, Lathander or whatever, whatever Pelor, whatever other sun god you use. Uh, similar with the other ones. It, to me, it's a goldmine of information and gameable ideas. And it's not just pointless detail. It's not just background information. It's like you can use this to craft adventures. You could use this to motivate players, to, to give them a goal, to give them something to do, to work towards, to strive towards, that you will create an adventure out of. I can't speak highly enough of it. I am so impressed with chapter two. Really glad that this was uh, as well done as it was. Mm -hmm. um, to back it up a bit, of course, piety is a version of the renown system, which obviously Ravnica also built on uh, in terms of its factions. It takes that one paragraph in the DMG where they go into piety and turns it into an entire chapter of examples, uh, gameable material, and advice for how to implement this in your game. It's, it's almost worth the price of the whole book alone, just this chapter. Mm -hmm. Well, and also, it's another currency in the game, other than, say, experience, to elicit a certain type of play. If you're just giving experience for killing monsters, people are gonna go out and kill monsters. Well, now if you're starting to give rewards for really role-playing and playing up your gods like tenants, actually bringing that to the table every session. Well, guess what? You might start getting more piety. Therefore, you start getting more spells-like abilities. And eventually, you're bumping up ability modifiers and your max. Like, at like 50 plus, every one of these things, it's like you raise this ability by two and the max by two. Yeah, yeah, that that's powerful. Yeah, every one of them has a capstone of, of when you hit that 50 benchmark, like you're saying, of usually it's a choice between yeah. one of two stats. And, and very rarely is it like wisdom and int, wisdom or int. It's usually like strength and int or, mm -hmm. or something. Like, so you, you have a lot of options and if they fit a lot of different character types. And so to, to go into a bit of detail, each of the gods has a list of what a certain score of piety, the benefit that it gives you. And so the benchmarks are 3, 10, 25, and 50. And they usually start out sort of minor benefits. It's, it's usually the equivalent of about a feat or, or a class feature. Mm -hmm. They're not just spells you can cast, although there are spells uh, that you get from them. A lot of times they're just abilities, things like qualities that you take on. And so in that sense, it's another way to customize your character. But I like what you were saying, and this was, this was sort of the, the thing that I grasped onto, is it's a separate advancement track instead of XP and level, especially the way XP seems to be handled at a lot of tables. Milestone seems to be really popular. Mm -hmm. And while I, I get the convenience of Milestone, one thing that Milestone does is it takes away the incentive uh, from players to earn their own XP. You know, there's something about like, you get XP for doing XYZ, killing monsters, getting treasure, whatever, that tells the players, this is what you do to advance in the game. Taking that away and saying like, ah, oh, we're gonna level up every few sessions or whenever the DM feels like it. I, I've never been satisfied with that. And so piety by saying like, here's how you earn a God's favor and here's how you lose it. It gives you a set of guidelines for what it is your character should be doing every day, every time you play. Mm -hmm. Like if there's ever a question of like, what should we do? Who has the most goals in common of the various gods that the party worships or is uh, champions of? Like, is there a common factor in any of these? Can we advance multiple gods' agendas at the same time? I think it's a powerful tool for directing a player-led campaign as opposed to one where the DM just sort of lays it all out and, and the players follow. Uh, and in that sense, I love the piety mechanic. I think it's really cool. Yeah, it's 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 a lot of fun. It doesn't even have to be tied to a god. There are ways to 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 use this mechanic in other ways. There's some magic items that uh, that have piety uh, attached to it. 
uh, that give you extra oh, abilities. Yeah. But yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. All throughout this book, they're, they talk about the story, the legend, the, the myth of the various parts of the setting. And one thing that, that, that there's, that's missing is like how to convey this information to players. How do they know what these myths are? How do they know what this legend of this artifact they just got was? And there's a little sub sidebar thing in chapter two that lists out some in-game texts, poetry, ep you know, epic poems, uh, you know, histories and things like that, that I think is tucked away in there. But to me, this is a section where you're like, oh yeah, how do they know anything? Well, they've read the cosmogony or they've read the origins of monsters or the theriad or, or uh, the, the Calafia, things that your characters are going to be familiar with in the same way that uh, people at, say, the height of, of, of Greek civilization were familiar with, like, Homer or Hesiod. Giving the DMs this, like, it's not just myths. It's like the ones found in this book here. Yeah. So, uh, it's impressive you are with Chapter 2. Uh, chapter 3, um, I mean, you know, there's yeah. some stuff there. I skimmed it. it it's <laughs> it's neat. Uh, you know, if, if you're into Theros, I'm sure it's cool. Yeah. Uh, they have a map, which apparently is the first time Theros has been mapped. And I'm, you know, the map's like, eh, I, I would have done it differently, mm -hmm. but that's fine. I'm not in charge of the book. But yeah. I would say that I could see myself turning to that chapter uh, using the tools in chapter four, because there are some sort of gods that, you know, that, that are tied to a place, like say Erebos in the underworld, you know, reading through what the underworld looks like, the different parts of it. Uh, that is a, you know, that's going to be vital if, if you're creating an adventure set in the underworld. Yeah. The setting stuff in most books, I'm kind of like, eh, I'm going to do my own thing. So might read this for inspiration later, but yeah. it's not usually my first go-to thing. But, uh, but chapter four though, uh, the, the chapter on adventures. <sighs> I mean, it is it is juicy with uh, various yes. uh, tables <laughs> and uh, just just like damn good advice on how gods will interact with this world and push adventure forward. Yeah, and to help adventure along. Absolutely, one of these chapters needs to be in every setting book. There's stuff here, like I mentioned, that that I think should be in the DMG and and specifically divine intervention and player agency. There's a section there where it's like, what does it mean for these these gods that while they might not be omnipotent and omniscient, they're still all powerful. Like they're, they're, they're still way beyond anything a mortal, even a, you know, a, a heroic 20th level mortal can take on. So how do you preserve player agency when these beings are moving about the world and, and, and partially influencing the course mm -hmm. of events? And it just has a solid, solid uh, section on it where it's like, hey, here's how you do this. You know, here is what it looks like. The, the, you know, do not violate these principles regarding you know what the players do. You know here is how you m use these characters, basically the gods, in a way that enhances what the players are doing, not negate it. Yeah, and it's also built into the setting itself. There's a reason the gods need champions, right? They they can influence things, but a champion is <laughs> is manifest in the world. They are they're there. They're not just like you know steering the course of events. They are creating their own path mm -hmm. uh, into the world. And so you can see why these gods need champions uh, to to you know enact their will within the uh, world the divine assistance section where it goes into act the actual like spells and how they interact and what it looks <clears> like <throat> for that to i want i want that like why why hasn't this been here before you know yes yes <laughs> and then the omen the omens fucking tables are just yeah thank you this is the kind of flavor text yes, that actually like i don't know it it, en yeah. it will enhance the gameplay by giving that atmosphere, setting that tone for the world. Yeah, yeah. The, these are one of those things. The, the omen table in particular is one of those game elements that at first glance you'd be like, what do I care? Like, who cares? But any good game mechanic answers a question for a dungeon master. To me, the omens answer that one that, that I've always struggled with, which is how to make divinations feel like something that is vital and, and useful as well. Usually divinations are either require you to have an idea of the outcome of something completely random uh, that you can't really plan for mm -hmm. <laughs> or require you to basically railroad because once you've locked in an outcome, it has to be that way. The way that they handle this where it's like, listen, these things can be ambiguous. You know, they could go either way. Maybe the, the characters receive an omen or, or cast an augury and they get an answer, but they've got to go to an oracle to figure out what that means. Well, there's an adventure. Right there. I find this section, you know, along with like actually going into like <laughs> augury, divination, commune, uh, or commune, 
Um, I cast commune. It's just so oh, invaluable. <laughs> right, I'll cast commune. Warden Kanan's commune. Um, sorry. In addition to things like intervention, I, the, the whole section on divine intervention is like, I don't know, do you have a cleric in your party in any game? Then maybe this section will be of use to you. Mm -hmm. How you know? How do the gods send emissaries in the world? What do they do? What does a miracle look like in a game like Dungeons and Dragons? And in addition to like, how do you not step on the player's toes with these things? Like just this first section of chapter four, it, you know, is really fascinating and just an interesting read, but then it sets up the fact that every individual god <laughs> gets their own section of what happened, you know, what is this God like if they're the villain of the campaign? What sort of allies and the like will they throw against the party? What kind of monsters do they have? What kind of villains do they have? And not just like a list of like the NPCs, but like this particular NPC. You know, so it's not like a knight. It's like a knight who has, you know, fallen from grace and seeks revenge of whatever, or a priest who, uh, you know, seeks to return those who've resurrected back to the underworld. So they, they come not just with the, you know, the enemy, but motivation and background. And in that sense, these tables combined with the tables in chapter two are all you would really need <laughs> to get uh, a lot, a lot of gaming uh, in, in this world. Chapter five is, is more about, uh, what was it, about nautical adventures, basically? Yeah, well, that's, that's a weird part, right? Because like chapter four is really three chapters in one. Well, yeah, there's that. And at least how it is on, on yeah. D&D Beyond. Um, <laughs> yeah, Nautical Adventures is uh, a supplement to the Ghost of Saltmarsh, which they explicitly call out, which I was like, that another that one book of fifth edition D&D &D, uh, references another book. That I just, I was, you know what I mean? To be um, <laughs> flippant, but I was like, wow, I'm, I'm actually... Like that actually stunned me because one of my chief um, I don't know, criticisms about fifth edition is that they're not integrated enough, that each book really does stand on its own and is not like formed a cohesive whole because they don't assume that you have any one book. Yeah. You know, uh, and I, I understand why, but I also like to see an integrated game system. For the most part, the nautical adventures deal with like mythic isles, who you can find there and the like, whereas Ghost of Saltmarsh is more mundane. Um, you know, how do you deal with a fire aboard a ship? Those two books in these two sections could make a, a real kick-ass, like Jason and the Argonauts, Odyssey style, mm -hmm. island hopping uh, kind of game. Um, the last section of chapter four, Underworld Adventures, I think that's the one I'm least impressed with because it's the most alien or inaccessible adventure location. You're going to this mythic realm of the dead. There's all these different wards to it different places uh, for it you're going to meet souls there uh, people the shades of people who have died but then it it lacks the type of gameable material that the other sections have had uh you know tables of, of motivations of enemies of, of plots what could be going on there uh and instead just gives you some advice and there is one table at the very end of it just kind of like, oh, i'll take that over nothing right but in terms of like its usefulness in creating an adventure as opposed to understanding what a place is like. It, it's not as much as the other parts of chapter four. And I, I am kind of disappointed with that, but it's like, you know, it's minor. Mm -hmm. Let's get to the one that most people are talking about, uh, chapter six, where there be monsters here. Oh yes. I mean, they, they, they of course go through all of the traditional, you know, mythic monsters, the Chimera, the Cerberus, mm -hmm, all that mm -hmm. fun stuff, right? The Fleece Mane Lion is probably my favorite, the <laughs> one that looks like an 80s rock singer. <laughs> right, from a hair metal band. And, and Fleece Mane Lion's a really cool, uh, like, boss monster for a low-level party. Oh, yeah. Right, it's, it's got spell turning, it's got some legendary action, it's kind of beefy, but it's also fairly low CR. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an example of one of those where it's like, you don't have to wait till they're high level before they can start having some mythic adventures and like slaying this beast, technically a monstrosity, um, <laughs> is one of those things that would be a feat of heroism for a first or second level party. This thing could wipe you out. Uh, for the most part though, I, I find that the base monsters here, they're not doing a lot for me. Yeah. Um, it's kind of neat that they're here. They got a good spread of both CR and monster types. Um, some of them are, are more interesting than others. Some of them leave my head, I'm sort of left scratching my head about. I'm thinking of particularly of Polucronos, the legendary Hydra that is not mythic. 
it, you know, <laughs> it's kind of like, well, wait a minute. I, he's on the cover, right? Like, this is the Hydra that's on the cover. Surely it's mythic. No. Um, <laughs> uh, and so in that sense, I was kind of, I don't know, disappointed isn't quite the right word. But it is sort of like, eh, it sucks. The other one was like the hundred handed ones. I was like, okay, I know they're not going to give me a hundred attacks. But I was expecting a little bit more uh, from that one. Still... They're monsters. They are uh, evocative of the setting. They're certainly the monsters I would go to first when creating adventures here. Um, the other thing that this chapter does is like talk about those D and D monsters that are already inspired by uh, Greek mythology that are there: dryads, basilisks, uh, and the like. The, like the differences that they have in this uh, particular uh, setting. Mm -hmm. So I appreciated those parts of it. But I don't know that people are here necessarily for. The regular no, monsters. No, 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 no. I don't think they're here for the mythic ones, which there are some. Uh, they, they are mythic. They which are. one stands out to you, there, Jim? Before I get too much into them, they all share some characteristics. They, they basically have a mythic trait, which triggers when uh, the creature hits zero hit points, and all of them have different conditions that will apply in that sense. Uh, but it also, once that trait kicks in, they get a separate set of legendary actions, or rather a supplemental set of legendary mm -hmm. actions that uh, they can access uh, on top of their regular legendary actions. Uh, and so that's sort of the basic form of legendary monsters. And in terms of like creating your own, that's the best you're gonna really get for like uh, back engineering or reverse engineering the monsters that they give you. They don't give you any tools to make your own. It's like they give you these three, and that's kind of it. And of the three, I really like the uh, the spider sort of uh, mythic monster, Arasta of the Endless Webs, mm, um, yeah. mostly because of the way that her abilities kind of synergize. There's a lot of really interesting stuff in the descriptions of each of these monsters about how they might be encountered. And so Arasta, it's kind of things like, dwells in an olive tree whose fruit can give you visions of the future. And so already I'm like, all right, that you know that's an adventure in and of itself <laughs> go make some olive oil out of the olives from this tree oh yeah you're gonna have to deal with this giant spider lady whose hair are the webs that you're having to hack your way through it's an interesting idea from a lore perspective uh, as a boss monster that's got a lot going on lots of restraints and grapples and like oh are you caught in her web well she's about to do something that's really gonna suck for you and then her mythic actions <laughs> once uh once she gets them have some neat riders to them like including things like that dispels magic you know they, she's gonna attack you with this thing and it's also gonna get rid of any six level or lower spells that you have and so in that sense i find a lot of synergy with it the others uh hithonia the cruel like a legendary medusa as a lower cr it kind of puts a mythic monster in range of mid-level characters. So Hithonia is like CR 17, and a CR 17, that's kind of deadly for uh, an 11th level party, if you're using the CR guidelines. And so I was kind of impressed by that, because I thought all of these would be for tw like yeah, 20 20th plus, level yeah. characters, like you're not coming anywhere near them. And it's not necessarily that, like uh, Arasta is sort of appropriate, deadly for like a 16th or 17th level party. Uh, Hithonia is like, 11th or 12th. What I like about Hithonia is that one of her mythic actions is she can force someone to look into her eyes. She can animate the petrified statues that are in her lair, have them grab you or, or come to life. So in that sense, she's pretty interesting. Wasn't as impressed with Hithonia as I was Arasta. And then finally, there is uh, Tromocratus, a uh, legendary, what they call a nadir kraken. And it has like low hit points compared to other monsters in its CR range. So like CR 24 dragons have more hit points than this thing. It has very few abilities to sort of like protect it from magic. So it's got like low saves, it does have uh, magic resistance and the like. It's like, hey, your deck save still sucks. I wanted to be wowed more by the mythic monsters, especially the, the uh, Tromocratus. And I just found myself going, well, this is a good start, but we, they, we could have gone, we could have done something different. Like fundamentally, we're not seeing anything that's very different than what we've seen before. There's not like crazy new abilities that are like, oh, wow, we've never seen that before in the game. It's more just like what's already there combined in new, different, you know, new ways. Even the mythic trait, which is like, you, you know, you've reduced them to zero hit points and now they come back, but with different powers and, and sort of refreshed everything. Even that is like fairly low hanging fruit in terms of a monster ability. It's like, again, this is a good start. I want to see more done with it. And in that sense, it's like 
have them not just like get some extra mythic actions, but like have a whole separate stat block for when they transform, mm -hmm. you know, have something else other than just these things they can do in between other people's actions. Cause they're meant to be capstone monsters. Like mm -hmm. you fight these at the end of your adventuring career. This is the culmination of a, of a, a lifetime of heroic deeds Yeah, is taking on one of these monsters. Yeah, And, and then it's not like it's nothing, right? Well, yeah, but the way they're set up though with the mythic qualities, it is very video game boss, right? You, you defeat them once and then they come back and they're slightly more angry and slightly different, and yeah. you gotta do it all over again. Yeah. You, know? hey, you gotta do it all over again with without as many resources as you had initially. Yeah. So I can see the second phase of the fights being tense. Uh, although as soon as you get access to say mass heal, a lot of that is negated. But it does speak to something that, I, that I've seen people talk about that I, I'm not sure I'm on board with. And that is the, the video gaminess of this mechanic and how a lot of people are like, oh man, this is gonna be like a fight, say an MMO or a certain video game where it, there's certain stages to the fight and, and, you know, and the boss changes. And in my sense, it's like, yeah, except you can repeat that fight indefinitely. <laughs> like if you die, you just reload your save. Or if we're talking like an MMO and you're like a raid boss, then it's like the whole point of it is that you die a bunch so that you can learn how the fight goes and then eventually figure out a way to defeat it and learn the patterns and be in the right place at the right time. And that's not how D&D &D combat works. Right. Like you don't fight the same monster a bunch of times to learn how it fights in order to defeat it. You usually just do it once. I'm not necessarily sure it's a good idea to sort of go down the path of we're gonna create boss monsters that are like video game boss monsters, if only because the medium is so different and the way you approach those challenges is so different that I'm not sure it translates very well. Mm -hmm. Of course, we'll have to see what these are, are like uh, in play. The one thing that stands out to me about the mythic trait is that it's shut down by a cantrip. <laughs> Uh, at least Acosta's in Hithonia's. And uh, Chill Touch, the cantrip, uh, has the rider, the creature that's affected by this uh, you know, spell, can't regain hit points until the start of your next turn. And at least for Acosta and Hithonia, the, the Medusa and Spider mythic monsters, their mythic trait explicitly says they regain hit points. If I were running these monsters, I'd change the language of the trait. They don't regain hit points. They have new hit points. Their hit points are set mm -hmm. at a certain mm -hmm. whatever after they die so that it completely bypasses the language of chill touch. But it is one of those oversights where I was like, is this on, like, for real? Like, <laughs> I know that you can't, like, account for everything when you're designing a monster. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe it's on purpose. Little, little Nick's flicks and chill touch. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> In that way, it's similar to Ravnica, where I'm like, I didn't expect to like it as much as I did, but yeah, bring, let's have some more. Come on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Give it five out of five gods. Would miracle again. <laughs>